Hi, my name is Deb Halfrich, and this is a bespoke video to Professor Robert Sapolsky of Stanford. Behave. What a seminal work. I am the single human who demonstrates the best of Homo sapiens sapiens while illuminating the worst of our society built on plantation capitalism. I am an acquired prodigious savant. Self-developed savant syndrome. Now, I had a toxic mold exposure um, in 2014, and I've been autistic my whole life without ever having anyone notice. I was that good. It's not even masking in my case. It's completely insulating. And I choose that word for a reason, because I was morbidly obese since I was an infant, until I turned 50. After 50, I had what we call in the Indian wisdom traditions a kundalini awakening. But what I would like to share with the world is that it's really about the philosophical hypothesis of bioelectricity. I am a degreed philosopher from Carnegie Mellon, and I've been on my, the campus of my alma mater, where I am right now, for seven months of homelessness, unable to find a single person to listen to me talk about the philosophical hypothesis of bioelectricity. I can use evolutionary logic and the math of life, but mostly evolutionary logic to tell a better story of human functioning that includes both bleeding edge science, all of the quantum physics, all of the neuroimaging, all of the embodied cognition, blended together with ancestral African wisdom. Now I know you got your start in being so smart in Africa. And I am looking for a way to go and do, I guess it's anthropology, but not really philosophy. Like I just want to go and talk about being human in Africa. And do the math between what it's like being human in the U.S. of hypocrisy. Robert, I know, you know, plantation capitalism, which is the system of absolutely every aspect of what happens to us as Americans, it is plantation capitalism. We have no freedom here. None. I know how to get our freedom back. Now, it's a long, long game, but I'm going to talk about brainwaves. The philosophical hypothesis of bioelectricity explains brainwaves, not just from the, expecting the details to illuminate the universal. I use the universal to decide which details have relevance and salience and which details are like, and eh, that explains how stuff works. I have a bespoke brand of thinking, which I call life-centric thinking, which belongs to every single one of the 7.9 billion of us across every nook and cranny of Earth. And that represents abundance incarnate. I have been pitching and pitching and pitching, and none of the people who live in the world of plantation capitalism can see my opportunity. I came to my alma mater, Carnegie Mellon, in order to have the opportunity to work with the Neuroscience Institute to have my brain scanned. So I'm now asking you, as a colleague, to help me find a place, create a place at Stanford. You know, it is the case. I was always extraordinarily smart, but I grew up in a very small town where nobody could assess how smart I was. But I would always find ways around the system. When I was 15, I did the math and I told the state of Ohio, you're wrong. I can graduate in three years, not four. And I did it. And I got accepted to Carnegie Mellon early decision. The only other university I was interested in was Stanford. And the reason 
I didn't get to know whether or not I'd be accepted to Stanford is the petite tyrant of a guidance counselor who said, you got accepted early decision to Carnegie Mellon. I will not send your transcript for you to continue applying to Stanford. I needed to know whether I could get into Stanford at that time. I bet I would have. And I, my life would have been different. The epigenetic environment around Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, I grew up about 45 minutes away. It killed me. The sensory overwhelm of my autism, what I had to do, I also had to deaden down my brain to exist here. In 1996, as a software consultant, I mean, what other job do you get when you graduate from Carnegie Mellon? I got a chance to come to the Bay Area, and I could always see I would have been an entirely different human if I'd had a chance to explore my undergraduate years at Stanford. I don't understand how Carnegie Mellon accepted me when I was 16 and won't pay a single conversation's worth of attention to me when I'm 52.5. So it's time to head on to Stanford. I am literally driving across the country on my way there the first week of December. Holler, let's find some place for me to talk about what I can offer this world via Stanford University. I'm going to sum it up with the three ways to understand the capacity of my savantness. I am the she Einstein of consciousness. I am the she Sherlock of human functioning. Very specifically, human energy, potential, and well-being, which is body, mind, soul, integrated and inclusive of every human across every nook and cranny of earth, I can give us a better definition of humanness, better definitions of chronic conditions, chronic disease, mental illness, neurodiversity is actually a feature, it is an adaptation. The different wiring of neurodiverse brains is a sane, rational, and necessary response to the toxicity of our societal and epigenetic environment. The legacy of industrialization, what that's done both to the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, but also the way we treat each other as if corporate cubicle captivity is the height of what humans have evolved to be able to accomplish. I can demonstrate what humans have evolved to be able to accomplish. I lost 150 plus pounds in the 15 months after turning 50, after that whole entire 50 years of being morbidly obese, using no standard diet or exercise advice, using the philosophical hypothesis of bioelectricity, which is why I have a better definition of humanness that it uses bioelectricity to talk about human energy, potential, well-being, which is body, mind, soul. One last thing. The last of the triad of my she from she Einstein of consciousness, she Sherlock of human functioning, it's the she Socrates of the 2020s. And in that capacity, I am going to become known as the Trojan giraffe of whiteness. The last 500 years of human civilization has been toxically poisoned by concepts of whiteness, which I can use evolutionary logic to tell better stories about so that we disrupt it, we stop it, and we start celebrating blackness. We start celebrating Africanness, Indianness, Chineseness, Papua New Guineaness. The wisdom of those ancestors, when blended with the actual data that we have, we just have bad hypotheses about the data. I dis dispute almost none of the data, but I dispute a significant portion, well over 80% of the hypotheses and the stories we tell about the data we have about brain waves. I am a brain woman of human functioning, and I am asking Stanford University to give me a sanctuary a annual salary 
and let me start writing this up. Let me start talking to philosophy professors and neuroscientists and neuroendocrinologists. We can watch things happen in my body. Let me tell you something. The, the, the sensory overwhelm, I can narrate it and you can give me data on what's happening. You know, heart rate variability, brainwave variability. And I can give us much better hypotheses on integrative and inclusive functioning of humanness. I want to work on behalf of everyone. I mean, that's what a philosopher does, is think on behalf of the collective, universally. And that I have spent the entire pandemic pitching this opportunity and have been rejected hundreds, if not a thousand times. It shows that our civilization is on the brink of collapse. And I know that you, between the two worlds, and me, between the two worlds of America and Africa, understand that in a much more intuitive and physiological sense. Professor Sapolsky, I am the colleague that you've always wanted to have. You didn't know about it. You couldn't have described me. But... Let me tell you something. When you hear how the wise feminine points out the blind spots in evolution, you could have a ball. It's going to be fun. All right. Harmony, reach out, please, at your earliest convenience. DebHalfrich.squarespace.com has all of my contact data. And you'll see a lot more about me. You'll see the pitches to Carnegie Mellon. You'll see I've tried to get Tim Ferriss's podcast. You will see I've pitched Esselin. The creativity in which I've tried to stay alive and for which I keep getting denied the simple dignity of a roof over my head. Money to feed my dog. Oh, she's hidden back there.